Senator, what is the role you believe of the federal government when it comes to protecting from cyber attacks these vital industries that have to do with national security? Should we be playing a more active role in Washington? Yeah, and I think we're trying. Um, I think there's some efforts to do that now. I think the first is mandatory reporting. In the case of the pipeline, obviously, they, that's not something that they could necessarily cover up because you could see the disruption. But there are plenty of businesses out there who get hit with ransomware attacks and never report it. Now, I think one thing is that that's, you know, some T-shirt shop somewhere or whatever it might be, and I'm not diminishing the importance of their business to those people, but it's not critical to the country. There's a difference between industries that are critical to the country. Right. You know, if you shut down a water plant, a pipeline, an air traffic control, things of that nature, then you got a big problem. So I think for those critical industries, there has to be reporting requirements where they tell us when they've been attacked. I think that there should be minimum requirements for what key infrastructure in this country have in place to defend itself. And I think there has to be a singular agency we have to create a new one, but someone who is in charge of the immediate response to it and um, and is constantly updating everybody about the latest and, and greatest technologies available to help prevent against this sort of attack. Yeah, what will our response be? Yeah. Well, I think, first of all, you have to attribute who it's to. And in many cases, these are just criminal groups that are out there doing this. Uh, many are former, I, mean, I listened to a clip there about President Biden saying there's no evidence Russia's behind it, but the actors are in Russia. Well, you, there's not a lot of American hacking groups out there hacking into the, uh, you know, Russian businesses and stealing them for or holding them up for ransomware. So clearly what you'll find is that a lot of the people involved in this are either cyber actors that once worked for the Russian Federation um, or have links to the Russian Federation. And in some ways, for example, for North Korea, it's part of how they generate revenue for the government. So I do think there has to be some level of attribution that we're pretty clear about. And, and so that people understand it. But I think we also have to be better awareness. I mean, a lot of businesses out there think they are postured against cyber attacks, but they really aren't. And look, there's no easy answer. These, these guys, are, this is their full-time job, to try to figure out how to get inside someone's system, steal their information, and say, we're not going to give it back to you, and you won't be able to run your business until you pay us the ransom. Right. And, uh, and this is another example of it. But I think we're going to see more cases of this. And I think some could be life-threatening if it happens to a hospital system or an airline or or something, or a pharmaceutical uh, company. I think you Damn. can see some real problems. Sure, absolutely. Of course, Joe Biden uh, turned off the Keystone Pipeline. One of the first things he did, he would never admit we need more pipelines, but this probably shows that we absolutely do. Meanwhile, Senator, speaking of Joe Biden, you know, uh, there was a terrible jobs number miss uh, at the end of last week, we were expecting a million jobs to be added. It was only something like 264,000. Uh, and everybody we've talked to on this program, small business people, say the reason we, the numbers are so soft is because we can't get anybody who wants a job. Because so many people are getting that $300 federal supplemental, they're staying at home. Yesterday, Joe Biden said, I don't know what people are talking about. That's not true. Watch this. I know there's been a lot of discussion since Friday, since Friday's report, that people are being paid to stay home rather than go to work. Well, we don't see much evidence of that. They lost their jobs to a virus and to a government that bungled its response to the crisis and failed to protect them. And for many of those folks, unemployment benefits are a lifeline. No one should be allowed to gain the system. And we'll insist the law is followed, but let's not take our eye off the ball. We're going to make it clear that anyone collecting unemployment who is offered a suitable job must take the job or lose their unemployment benefits. And so, Senator, he's saying if people are getting the unemployment benefits and they are offered a job, they've got to take the job. Okay, that's the rule. However, we know that there are a lot of people in this country who are not doing that. Yeah, it's hard to enforce it. Look, I read these articles out there and I just shake my head. Like Republicans claim that people don't want to go back to work. I'm not calling anybody lazy. I do call people logical. And the logic tells you that if you're going to make almost as much or even more in some cases not working than working, you're going to do that until such time as that no longer exists. But look, it's not me saying that there's a labor crisis. Literally, there is nowhere I can go in South Florida or anywhere in Florida and the small business doesn't. I saw a sign yesterday at a coffee shop in Miami. It said, due to the labor crisis, we are understaffed. Everyone is telling us this. Right. And I hear these reports. Well, it's because people are afraid their kids can't go back to school. Schools have been open in Florida since September. Oh, well, you know, people are afraid about the virus. You can walk into a CVS or a Walgreens and get a vaccine now. 
So bottom line is simple, and and and, and that, that is um, what they what employees are telling the employer is when my unemployment runs out, then I'll come back to work. Right. I'm going to make more, or I can make almost as much not working, and I can make some money on the side and not have to report it for tax purposes. Again, I'm not calling anybody lazy. This is a logical. This, uh, you know, numbers-based decision that some people have made. I'm not saying it's the only factor, but it's real. It's small businesses that are telling us they cannot fill job right. openings. They have 100 openings, three people apply, only one shows up, and they quit after the first day. Right, and if you want to know in other states, not Florida, you wouldn't know that directly, uh, what it is like why women are staying home in great numbers. It's because a lot of these schools won't open, and, they say, and he does, never brings up that link, but goes out of his way to take a shot at Trump which is uh, classless. Uh, we thought that he was the mature guy in the room. Uh, the, meanwhile, there's some breakthrough when it comes to this vaccine. I think uh, Operation Warp Speed gave us the vaccine, and now we understand they're going to go for permanent uh, green light. Uh, Pfizer is anyway from the FDA. And now they're talking about green lighting this vaccine for 12 to 15-year-olds. Are you in support of that? And I think that's going to happen, again, based on all the science that's out there on it. This is the largest clinical trial in human history at this point. You know, millions of people have been vaccinated. We now have months of data on it. But here's the other thing I would say. This vaccine, and I had an op-ed that's up on foxnews.com that people can read, is a good example of how industrial policy, targeted industrial policy, can work. This was, Operation Warp Speed will go down in history as one of the greatest successes in American history. It is the government partnering with the private sector. To, to take existing research and repurpose it and massively produce a vaccine, not one, we're now going to be up to four pretty soon, available. We've done vaccines by far better than any nation on the planet. Right. And, uh, and it's one of the reasons why you're starting to see more and more things get back to normal. But it's a good example of how a targeted partnership between government right. and the private sector can, can help serve the common good. I'm not saying this applies to every issue, but on these big major issues of China and everything else, it's a pretty good example. And I think Warp Speed will go down as, as I said, as one of the great successes in American history. Yeah, no one's lining up for Sputnik or the Chinese, uh, the Chinese vaccine. Uh, the Chinese vaccine is a joke. Just ask uh, Brazil. Real quick, Senator, how much, it, how much, uh, how would we benefit? from Joe Biden coming out crediting President Trump. So when people feel as though the vaccine is Joe Biden's or the vaccine is Donald Trump's, there could be that mix where people could say, if you have a hurdle to clear, doesn't matter who you voted for. Trump gave it to you. We gave it. We, we helped distribute it out. It's not going to happen, Brian. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, look, politics has now infected everything in our country, yep. and that includes things like medicine, you know, and it's unfortunate. But in the case of Operation Warp Speed, you know, it happened under Donald Trump's presidency. It was directed by his administration. You can say anything you want about the early days and the shutdowns and the mask and anything, you know, people have their opinions on that. Sure. What is indisputable is we now have three approved vaccines. We should have a fourth pretty soon. No, Most countries barely have one, if any, and, uh, and they were developed basically less than a year yep. within nine or ten months of this fact of this uh, uh virus emerging that's an historic achievement it would have been impossible anywhere else in the world and it's a reminder of why we have to have an industrial capacity thank god we can make vaccines in this country because if we couldn't make them we'd be begging some other country to make it for us and they'd take the lion's share of that production away from us. senator before you go real quick uh you know the president is going to meet with some of your colleagues in the senate talking infrastructure do you think the Democrats and Republicans will find common ground? Will there be a smaller bill or will it be a no deal? You know, I think, first of all, it's not about bigger or smaller. It's about doing the right. You know, we shouldn't spend a dollar more than we need to. We should invest sufficiently in the things that we need. Roads, bridges, infrastructure. There's widespread support for that. Roads and bridges and infrastructure is not a partisan issue. At least it doesn't have to be. So do I think there will be a deal? I don't know because it's so hyper-partisan up here. Do I think there can be a deal that's good for the country? I absolutely believe there can be, and I hope today's the beginning of that. We'll find okay. out. Yeah, the, the Republicans are up to around $800 billion. He wants $2.4 trillion. And it's, good, it's easy for them to debate it. It's not their money. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And again, look, at the end of the day, it's what does it cost to build the roads and bridges we need? And that's what we pass. But you don't add a bunch of stuff to it that has nothing to do with roads and bridges and infrastructure, yeah. which is what they've been trying to do in their initial proposal. Like health care. Yeah. Crazy. Human infrastructure. So much money. It's our money, too. Senator, thanks for coming on. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, God, I mean, we'll look forward to your column on top right up now on foxnews.com. Foxnews